All right, I guess uh, it's time to get started here. So before we start, I'm curious a little about the people in the room. Um, how many of you all are already using NoSQL? Okay, it's so about half. And then um, how many people in the room are mobile developers? Okay, so about half, but not necessarily the same half. That uh, so means I'm in the right room. Um, so I'm a co-founder of Couchbase. I've been working on technology for about four years now. And over the last uh, few years, we keep hearing you know, from users, um, one of the things that Couchbase has done well at is kind of stay above the competitive fray with all of this NoSQL um, you know, action that's happening right now. Uh, but our 2.0 release is our, our beta, 2.0 is right around the corner, and so it's time for the gloves to come off, right? Um, it's time to get competitive, and uh, and the best way to get competitive is with a rap battle. So I'm going to start this with my rap battle, and then uh, and then we'll talk tech. So uh, you might find also in the lyrics that Couchbase is an, uh, a uh, abbreviation, right, for uh, what we thought we could. So cluster of unstoppable commodity hardware, be allocating so enterprise, low latency, makes a minimum cash key, watch a disk write queue, calculate, keep it clean, index your data with JavaScript, hit a couple lines of code, pick the keys you omit. Port 8091112.11 for Couchbase. Data is a serious obsession. Simple, fast, elastic, synchronizes, sizes to your workload. We are the reliable bits. <laughs> so I hope to hear some of the other NoSQL vendors with their wraps soon. Um, that's all another series. So mobile. Uh, mobile is different from what's come before uh, in the web, and I think these are the big four differences. Um, I'm just starting to bleed over to the rest of the web, but I really see mobile as, as leading this uh, growth. There's a whole different environment in which apps can grow. And uh, you know, if you've got a mobile app, you're talking about different dynamics for user acquisition, and it can be more challenging to scale than the web dynamics that you're maybe familiar with. Um, speed, right? The uh, mobile devices, it's in the user's hands, and so it's therefore more personal, and they're going to take latency much, uh, you know, much more seriously. If your app is slow, they're going to feel that in a way they might not if it was on their desktop. Flexibility. The mobile world is inherently harder to control than the web. In the web, you can run a software update and all your users get the new software. Uh, in the mobile world, you don't have that latitude. You may have software that ships on uh, carrier handsets that you have no control over. You may have software running on old iPhones and new iPhones and uh, a rolling upgrade wave that you don't have much control over. And then the last thing that mobile's really brought into the mainstream is push, and uh, the need to send messages to the user where they are based on you know, some of it that happened in your cloud. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, those four topics. Growth, again, um, here's some numbers to give you an understanding of just really how big it is. Um, there's 2.2 billion internet users. 50% of Americans use smartphones. So that's not even um, you know, your regular, uh, your regular mobile phones. And you're having to go overnight. We'll look at some examples of that. So these charts here are, are showing um, in smartphones, you know, that's the breakup of 50% uh, of Americans using smartphones, and most of them are on Android and iPhone. Uh, this graph uh, down here in the corner is number of uh, mobile game players and, and social game players, and that's you know hundreds of millions of people right there. Um, so there's a lot to be ready for when you're going to be scaling your mobile app. For instance, Instagram. This is a graph of their monthly active users from just before the Facebook acquisition. So. They launched on Android and they gained a million active users literally overnight. Uh, they were able to take that because for them it was only a small bump. I mean, it was, it was a meaningful fraction, but you know, they were sort of ready for it. Still, there's all these people ready to run your app, 
and uh, they can install it and now your traffic is up the, that next level. Um, so I want to redefine the, the units here. Um, for a while people were talking about an Instagram being a billion dollars, but with the recent stock market action that doesn't really quite hold anymore. Um, but I still think it's fair to look at the amount of traffic they were pushing at the time of acquisition and call that an Instagram. So an Instagram is seven and a half million monthly active users. And by that metric, Instagram itself is up to like three or four Instagrams already. They've been growing. So nothing, nothing old still here. Um, but now that we know an Instagram, that's about as much traffic as a billion dollar web service pushes. Um, we, can, we can use it to gauge other stuff. So who here has played the game Draw Something? Um, yeah, it's uh, probably more popular outside of this room, but I know that I played it with you know family members. And, um, it was downloaded by 50 million people in the first 50 days after launch. Uh, in the first two months, it scaled to five Instagrams of traffic. And uh, I'm here to talk about how they did that without skipping a beat. Um, so let's zoom into the beginning. The beginning of this stuff is the hard part, right? It, you're already over the hump. Um, you know your game is a hit. You know your site is a hit. You know your app has a business case. You can scale that. I mean, it's a, that's all the problem. It's the part where it's a surprise that you have to scale that is uh, that's really interesting here. So we can zoom in uh, on this chart. The, the larger context of getting to 35 million monthly active users is, is that orange line. But the first three weeks here are um, you know these data points you can see. And so what happened was draw something was out there was getting you know modest traction, but nothing really huge. And then they got on TV. So the answer is if you want to have a hockey stick growth curve, get on television. Um, but the other thing they did is they were ready for it. So there's um, you know, sort of a, a phrase that goes around in the online gaming world of uh, escape velocity, right? How much how much traffic is this app going to get at its peak? And then there's a whole science of figuring out what that escape velocity is early on. Um, and then the only thing that really throws a wrench in that science is that the faster your app is growing, the more likely it is to crash and burn. So it's essentially the apps that have a really high escape velocity that don't crash and burn that turn into $200 million properties. So how do you keep from crashing and burning in that crucial window? Uh, that's, that's a $100 million question. And uh, underneath the hood, you know, underneath all that traffic, uh, what does it look like to the database? It looks like 5,000 drawings per second. And this isn't even the peak. This is you know, just, just around the time of uh, the single acquisition of uh, draw something. And uh, you know, over 100,000 database operations per second and a few terabytes of data. It's grown you know, since then by leaps and bounds. Um, but uh, even at the acquisition, that's, that's some pretty heavy traffic. Uh, they won't let me tell you exactly how many servers they were running on, but it's not like as many as you would expect, I think, because Capitalist is pretty fast. Um, by contrast, this is what can happen if you get it wrong. They got everything right. Um, they got everything right except for the $100 million gap, where the game took off faster than the back end could handle it. The game performance started to drop, and they had to pull the game from the app store. So your worst case scenario isn't that nobody ever sees your work. It's that everybody wants to see it, and then you have essentially technical difficulties and go out of business. So don't let this happen to you. So growth, growth is very critical to getting these games right. Speed is a different angle, right? You can have something that grows well, but not all that fast. You know, something that's super fast that doesn't really scale. Um, but if your thing is going to grow a lot, it probably got to be fast in the first place because there's so much um, you know, research out there that shows that users respond to speed. So users don't like to wait. If you've ever been in this situation, I've been in this situation, and a lot of times, by the time this happens, I've forgotten why I was even running that. 
internet search or you know uh, I went out to check my email and said uh, that the loading bar anytime your back end is, is being slow for your users it's a good chance for them to go somewhere else so don't let it happen to you and there's a lot of objective data to back this up so even going back to 2006 Google was running experiments where they would extend the number of search results on the front page. Instead of showing 10 results, they showed 30. And you think, oh, that's better, right? There's more richness there. Traffic dropped off measurably because it takes longer to render 30 result items than 20. And users care about being able to iterate on their searches, not scroll. So this is going to show up in pretty much every application you look at that's interactive where users are connecting to the cloud. Uh, there's been more research, if you follow that link, the cost of latency, uh, Amazon has done research to show that you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of slowness to have a user essentially you know, get that bad experience once, maybe it's just one page request, but you've poisoned your brand to that user for a measurable amount of time. So uh, again, in mobile, and this is really uh, talking again about the growth question, but in mobile you don't know when the thundering bird is going to hit. You don't know when uh, you're going to get talked about on television. And, and then there's this hit-driven business. So are you going to invest equally in scaling all your apps, or are you going to wait until it matters? And it used to be you had to invest equally right, in all of them because scaling is hard. Um, but hopefully you can you know, ride that curve a little more closely and, and save some money on the way up. So what counts as fast? Um, this is a benchmark. I guess the numbers are a little too small to see here, but um, at the slowest that that graph gets is half a millisecond. Um, and that's with uh, your standard kernel uh, kind of slow Ethernet cards with the 10, 10G Ethernet cards and uh, the user space drivers. Slow on this chart is you know, 150 microseconds. Uh, so this is for, uh, as you go to the right on the latency chart, the payloads get larger. As so you see, it's even, even flat there. Um, this kind of sub-millisecond latency is good for you know, keeping your users engaged. Where it's really important is if you have to meet time-based service level agreements, if you're doing advertising or um, you know, those kinds of things where you have a contract that says you're going to turn around the whole thing in 20 milliseconds and your database better not be a, a big part of that window. So the other interesting thing from, from this uh, Cisco benchmark is that as they add nodes to the cluster, the throughput goes up better, better than linearly. Um, and that's not going to continue to happen all the way up to an infinitely sized cluster. But uh, Couchbase at least opens up somewhat between you know, five and 30 nodes, uh, you, get, you get some benefits, right? It's less crowded, each box is doing a little bit less busy work and, and more data work. So it's nice to see that that, you know, shows up on the, the graphs as well. Can you give some numbers on the Sure, yeah, yeah, that is kind of small to see. Um, I'll just walk down here and take a look at it. I can't remember, I think, it's, I think we're talking about, um, uh, Three node cluster is about 900,000 ops per second. And uh, five node cluster is about, about 1.6 million ops per second. When you say nodes, it's 15 shots? I mean, I, I forget exactly what hardware they were running here. The shot or? These are, these are visual boxes. I think they had SSDs. Uh, I'll get into later to talk how Couchbase spreads your data across the cluster. Um, but essentially, you can just throw boxes at your cluster and you get curves like this. So, you might have to scale in a hurry. Hopefully, it's a surprise. Um, one of the key points I really want to make here is not a technical point, it's a you know, sort of a, a business or an organizational point. When you get on Jersey Shore, and all of a sudden you have 20 million more app downloads than you did yesterday, you don't want to be thinking about scaling your data layer. You want to be thinking about all the other good things that come with that. Um, so that's why you know, we encourage people to get out ahead of the curve and be ready to scale rather than you know, get hit with um, you know, long nights and, and potential failure. <coughs> and I don't have time in this talk 
to actually do a demo and bring up screens and stuff, but you know, part of the reasons why uh, operations folks you know, have the success they do with Couchbase is that it's been built from the ground up for operations. Right? A lot of the times, I, at least I've you know, done enough of going into an organization and describing a database, and you can get the developers excited about it. Oh, look, some neat new capabilities. Oh, isn't that fast? But it's hard to sell it into ops because these guys are on the disks. They don't want to do new stuff. I mean, they have a good reason for that. But if you uh, if you get the right you know right technology, and, and this I've seen this happen a lot with us. Talk to the ops team. I, the ops team will turn around and sell it to the developers, right? Because oh, you can do a hot backup without downtime. No, There's various things they want. You give up, make the ops team happy, and, and they'll make the developers happy for you. Um, and then uh, another feature that is necessary if you care about low latency is this cross data center replication, where you have multiple points of presence that are all asynchronously communicating. Um, and it's, you know, they're going to have longer latencies between clusters than you'd like to have between your app server and cluster. Um, but this means that you can offer low latency to people no matter where they are in the world and give them a uh, you know, roughly consistent snapshot of the whole data set that the other users are seeing. So this feature will be new in Couchbase 2.0, and we think it's a big differentiator. Flexibility, I mentioned earlier that mobile apps have a different upgrade life cycle than web apps. Web apps you just hit deploy, you know, maybe you have a rolling deploy that takes 10 minutes. But you don't have a rolling deploy that takes you know, a few weeks while users consider maybe upgrading. So if you're going to be talking to these old, uh, old clients out there, they're sending you old schemas over the wire, it sure is helpful if you don't have to enforce a rigid database schema. So JSON is, uh, I, I'm going to assume everyone here is comfortable with JSON. Uh, you know, other audiences may, may be new. But the key here is that you just put your data structures that your application server deals with into the database. There's a bunch of benefits you get from that. Flexibility, of course, being a key one, but there's also performance benefits that come you know, purely just by using a denormalized approach to data access. Right? Uh, Martin Fowler in his NoSQL book calls it uh, aggregate oriented. So when you have these aggregates and you're interacting with the database in terms of aggregates, now the database has visibility into your data access patterns in a way that it wouldn't have with a relational database. The relational database, you build a schema that has some sort of measure of correctness, um, and maybe it's good you know, from a data compression standpoint for storage, but essentially, aside from the indexes and hints you get it, all access patterns are considered equal to the relational database. With NoSQL, the access patterns that your application is doing are privileged, right? They're going to be faster because it's a much simpler operation for the underlying software. And for mobile developers, uh, I know that at least today, dealing with JSON and Objective-C is not as fun as dealing with certain other data structures. But there are some changes coming in the compiler that allow for some neat macro stuff that makes uh, you know, makes JSON inside of Objective-C look a lot more like it does in JavaScript or other kind of uh, more scripting-ish languages. So that's just one thing that points toward the momentum of JSON you know, becoming the default. I think you maybe already say it has. Uh, XML will be around for a long time, but JSON has uh, has a lot to recommend it, and you know, not the least of which is the fact that developers seem to like it. So, if when I was talking about scale and speed, you know, that's just a little bit, oh, I don't really care about that. And some people, you know, so we did a survey, um, and we thought that the number one reason that NoSQL users were interested in NoSQL was scale, and we thought the number two reason was performance. The speed. But it turns out that while those are important, the number one reason that people get into SQL is because they want a flexible data model. They don't want to deal with schema migrations. So that was a learning experience for us, and in hindsight, not much of a surprise. 
But I like to uh, point that out because you know the, the sort of softer reasons for doing things get left behind, right? Because I mean, you talk about the business case, you talk cost of ownership, but having happy developers is worth a lot. So one uh, kind of unique strength of the couch-based query model is the ability to query messy data. A lot of the JSON I see is just like a big bag of mess, right? It's just somebody poured this API into the database and they came along and poured this API in, and, and then this API has an inversion and they're just gonna keep pouring it into the same container. Um, and before you know it, uh, there's, it's just a mess. Um, and so, do you want to have a whole bunch of code in your application that's job is to ferret out the different versions of JSON that you stored and what's the right way to display this? And you know, does this field null to an empty string or should it be left out? You know, those kinds of questions. Um, it's nice to have those live in one place. And traditionally, in the relational database world, the database has been in charge of those kinds of questions. And with Couchbase, uh, it gives you the opportunity to do that as well. So the query model uses uh, JavaScript to inspect your data and figure out how to index it. And aside from that, you know, I call it MapReduce, and I call it JavaScript, and both of those things are going to sound kind of different from the relational model. But really, we're talking about alter table add index. So you run alter table add index, and you put a SQL expression on the end of there, and it drills into your table and picks this column or these two columns, and now you have an index. Um, so we've all done that. With MapReduce, you're uh, doing the same thing. You have a JavaScript function that's drilling into your document and figuring out. So let's say you have help tickets and you want to sort them by you know, date and the user ID, uh, or user ID and date, right? So your old help tickets were just something typed into a Word document, and your new ones are a structured JSON, and there's some stuff halfway between in your history of, of, of things your application has done over the years. You can write this one function that, you know, if doc.body is big in our string, run a regex to extract the username from the timestamp. If doc.body is nicely structured with version one, you know, drill down here to the timestamp of the user ID, you know, else if doc. you know, whatever is the new structure, well then the timestamp is already in the format we like, you don't have to convert the timestamp format say. Um, so you can have that kind of complex richness of extracting the salient information from messy data in the database in a way where it will maintain the index for you. So this allows uh, what I like to say normalize after the fact. So save what you've got, capture the user's intent. Right? Don't worry about cleaning up the data too much on the way in. You don't want to save fraudulent data or users who haven't logged in or put the wrong user ID on something. That those are application concerns. But your application doesn't need to be concerned with how the data used to look or you know, transition between how it looks now and how it's going to look in the future. You just want to save what the user gave you into the database and then normalize it at query time. And because of that, you're essentially compatible with all the existing JSON APIs that are out there. You can hook up a pipe from Twitter to Couchbase and then you know, reformat it so it gives the same output, output format as the Flickr API because you already have a bunch of Flickr data in your database. Uh, so that's that's really flexibility in a nutshell. This, this, some of these topics I won't get to go back to later in the talk, so if folks have questions about that, this is a good time. Yes? Yeah, so that's, um, I didn't say incremental MapReduce, but that's what we do. It's, um, that's why I say alter table add index. You define an index, we maintain it for you, and the queries are running against the index. And the details are the index is, is maintained behind the writes. So unlike in a relational database where you have like some foreign key indexes that need to be checked before the write can commit, we just write it. And then the indexer, Every time there's a query, it says, oh, I need to bring myself up to date with what's happened since the last query. So push. Push is the last of these things that I see as being really kind of new in mobile. Uh, and, and we all know what it is. It's your application or your cloud 
your application is everything from client all the way up to the cloud, is somewhat context aware or event aware and can give that information out to the user in a timely manner. So this is just a, a little bit of a tease for upcoming functionality in 2.0. But as I mentioned earlier, we have the cross data center replication capability. And uh, I'm an engineer. I don't like for one piece of code to just do one thing. Uh, that same stream that keeps your other data center up to date, you can hook whatever onto that, right? Your code onto that stream and gather events. So write some stuff going to the database. You have an event stream coming off the database and you're able to convert that into push notifications. And it's as simple as, you know, in this case, an on change function. Or if you're in a JDM, it would be a different language, right? But you just got an event feed and, and things are happening in your code uh, because things have happened in the database. And that avoids, you know, you having to do, you know, something in your application server that really should happen asynchronously after the data is committed. Or if you want to have a cluster that's hooked up via cross data center replication to, to other clusters, and these are all handling your live traffic, and the data flows to a cluster that's essentially just back end event processing. And those same events will eventually you know, come through that too as well. So the question is can your database do this? Um, and some can, some can't. I, I won't say that this is strictly the domain of couch based, but it's easier to do these sorts of things with NoSQL, that's for sure. Uh, so, so now to take the last few minutes of the presentation and just kind of give an overview of Couchbase. Um, we pride ourselves on being simple, and that goes so far as that the current release version 1.8 is strictly a key value interface. You talk to it via the MCACHD protocol. All the query capabilities, those are coming in 2.0 beta. They're developer preview builds available of 2.0 now. Um, so we, we keep it simple, use protocols that you already have in your data center. Fast, of course, is that's where at least we make our money, right, is that if you, if you really need to be fast, there aren't a whole lot of, of other options, um, especially when you may have to grow in a hurry as a surprise. Um, that said, everything we do is open source, so most of our users don't pay us. Um, now, the traditional database, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but who here has ever um, had to just get a bigger and bigger box on their database until they gave up? Yeah, um, I, I think that's how I got into NoSQL in the first place. Um, so, scale out your uh, data layer, like your application layer, of course that's what we're all here to talk about. Uh, so let's look at how Couchbase does it. So here I've got uh, two application servers and three database servers. And the documents are spread evenly across the database servers. And now each application server is going to be aware of the cluster topology. So reads and writes will go directly to the data nodes that own the data. Uh, so we see here that document number five is under heavy mutation for multiple application servers. Maybe it's Maybe that document itself is, you know, fielding 100,000 updates per second. Uh, you can use Couchbase for a strong agreement because there's a single physical owner of any given document at any given time. So you've got these application servers interacting via this document. And if they're, again, the thing to note is if they're not going through a proxy, the application servers are topology aware. So as the document moves, they'll go make a direct connection to the new home of the document. And we'll see how that, that happens um, as we add nodes here. So now we're going to bring two additional nodes online. And what Couchbase does is rather than as you add a node, now it's participating in the traffic and then kind of have this you know, problem of adding nodes and, and the rebounds kicking off right away, instead you can join nodes to the cluster. So say you've got a three node cluster and you throw 10 more nodes on there and nothing happens yet except for they become aware of each other. Then you press the button and it all rebalances at once. So this prevents you having to do a bunch of, of little moves and allows it to be much more efficient. You could even say um, have a five node cluster of, of version 1.8 
and a five node, and then add five nodes of 1.81, and remove the old nodes in a single operation. So that's how people will do upgrades. So what will happen is it will figure out the right way to move the data. Uh, the granularity of removing the data is, is um, someone asked earlier about shards. We call them V buckets, virtual buckets. Uh, let's call them shards, it doesn't matter, right? Um, it is, what we do is we pre-shard the data into 1,024 slices. And then we put those slices evenly on the servers you have. So you have one server, it's got all the slices. If you have two servers, they each have 512. And as you add servers, we're just moving slices around. So you're not going to be able to add more than 1,024 servers, but that hasn't been a problem for us yet. The, uh, and, and so as you're, uh, as you're moving these slices, the client libraries, all they have to do, they don't have to know for each document where it lives. They just have to know for each slice where does it live. The mathematics, right, the hash function from a document ID to a particular slice is trivially known by the clients. So we've, uh, we've rebalanced the data over, and what will happen is, um, well, there's kind of a couple of code paths that happen depending on what your client libraries look like, but, but basically, they'll start getting the data in a new location without skipping a beat in the best case. And in the worst case, it will make a single request that fails with a, you know, my shard has moved error, and then the client resets itself and gets the new cluster map. So you may be talking about you know, steady state one millisecond latencies and then on rebalance, you know, per application server, a two, milli two millisecond latency once for each application server. And so now we have uh, those same application servers are, are, you know, aware of the documents and looking directly in the new locations. Now things aren't always um, that easy, right? What happens if you're talking to a node that goes away? Um, it's not, you know, it's not fun when it happens. It's hardware, so hardware goes away. And uh, and so, in our older versions, we didn't do anything. We 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 just got sad through errors, um, and then the errors made it clear enough that the user, the administrator, should press the fix it button and fail over the node. Now we have auto failover, so if it detects a node is missing for longer than the timeline you specify, it'll do it for you. Um, and there's some nuance there, right? We don't want to cause cascading failure, so it, auto, it won't auto fail over twice in a row. Um, but when you do fail over a node, what it means is we promote the replica copies to active. And that's nearly instantaneous because the replicas are already in RAM on all the other nodes. So you flip a bit, and now they're promoted to active. And we republish the cluster map and the clients will go reach the data at the new location. So that's, uh, that's the essentials of how failure recovery happens. And there's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of pathway failures. The node going away is almost easier, right? It's kind of more interesting when the node is still there, but, or, you know, but, but not really. Um, for instance, Amazon uh, Elastic Block Store a few months ago had a cascading failure and the symptom was these storage devices were no longer accepting operations, read the writes. And so now you are, your data is not gone, it's just inaccessible. Well, a lot of the internet was down that day. We saw outages from various high profile properties. Uh, a lot of the Couchbase customers were minimally affected because any user whose data was already in RAM, it was already in RAM, the writes queue up to disk, oh, this disk is very slow, right? That's what Couchbase saw. This disk is just frustratingly slow. So the write queue backs up. And of course, any, any sessions that were not currently active, right, that weren't in the working set, they're unreachable. But a lot of Zynga's games stay online during this because the data that mattered was already in RAM. And then when the disks started being operable again, that data would flow down to the disks and it was you know, as though they had an outage except for that slice of users who tried to log in and establish a session during the last block store outage. So 
There's uh, just a couple of examples of uh, mobile usage here. One of our customers is Concur. They do expense tracking uh, for them. The big challenge is how do I track you know, millions of receipts as they flow through workflows. The JSON document model is really nice for workflows because you can just take the data that you've got and then tag it with different states. So you can have more than one state machine floating along on the same document if you want to. Um, makes it really easy. A anything you do on paper today or 10 years ago, right? It's a great fit for a document database. Uh, another one of our mobile use cases is NTT Docomo. They're the largest uh, mobile provider in Japan, and they use us for some heavy data analytics stuff, um, which is pretty interesting, I guess, so got to help them with that together. And this is a lot more, and it's still even, you know, a, uh, a partial list with not all of these are mobile. I, I want to put together a slide with just people who use Couchbase for a mobile backend. Uh, so hopefully you'll see that soon. Uh, so we're running up against uh, the end of time here. The last thing I want to make sure everyone knows about is that in San Francisco on September 21st, we'll be having an all day Couchbase event. So please join us there. Um, speakers are going to be interesting. So it's, it's a lineup of a bunch of enterprises that are doing serious stuff with high velocity data. So uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. <coughs> So, it seems like it's not a master slave. It's not like you give a uh, replica IP address and so you need a copy. So, can you tell sure. me more about how the replicas are done? So, the question is how does the replica, um, how does the replica system work? Right. And the way I mentioned earlier, we have the data in 1,024 slices. So, you can set the replication factor for the cluster. Um, typically, people will run with one or two. We have the option to run with three replicas, but that's going to eat up a lot of RAM. Um, right? So every time a write comes in, it hits a node. And that hits memcache, and it commits it to memory and returns to the client by default. And so that's as safe as memcache now. But what do you want is safer? You want replica safety. And so the very first thing that happens after that is it gets queued into a couple of queues, one queue for disk and one queue for remote. And so that will stick it on another node of the cluster. And if it got here in one millisecond, it'll get here in two or three milliseconds. Um, and so, and that, you know, and that can be one replica or two or three. Um, now, the reads and writes, it's a, it's a strongly consistent system. For a given key, the reads and writes always go through the active copy. And so then we fail over atomically to a replica when we need to. So the replicas are, are hot standbys. They're never um, live, you know, read and write copies. Whenever there is a read, it, it's going to go to the uh, master copy or the latest copy, right? Right. And we don't read the replicas until master fails. Exactly. Fails. Yeah, we don't read the replicas until we're willing to write to them. But for the scalability, don't you think that's a good practice to read? Uh, 30 reads, it's an interesting problem, right? Where it comes up for us is that when you get clusters larger than 50 nodes-ish, that's when you're going to see nodes falling out of the cluster that aren't dead, and then they come back. And a typical node failure is going to be less than 30 seconds. Uh, so it's kind of gone, and then it's back. And when you have those kinds of scenarios, that's when you really want 30 reads, or even 30 writes. Uh, and so we are planning on that sort of thing in a future release uh, with you know, just taking inspiration from some of the vector clock stuff and the dynamo stuff. But we don't really think the eventually consistent model is what developers want. They want to have consistency on a key. So you know you can run one of these keys as a memcache key counter. Like I did a um, you know a textual analysis. Tokenize the text every time you see a token increment that counter. Um, and then run MapReduce to get the results. It's, it's, it's kind of a new thing I had not before. Um, 
So using those keys for, for strong agreement is, is an important engineering goal for us. Um, and, and that said, you're, you, there's, there's some validity, right, in it, the idea of a replica being different from your live data set, and it's sort of different ideas of, you know, is, is a replica really there as a backup, or is it there to maintain high availability? So for us, it's really about high availability, and we have other stories for backup, where you can take file system snapshots, and you know, those kinds of things. Other questions? <coughs> From the client side and from the JavaScript side, and so that how do you handle the security in terms of? So that's, that's a good question. The question is the client access method and security. And with Couchbase, you talk to it via the MCACHD protocol. And so you're not really, it's not designed as a protocol that, say, your mobile device would talk directly to your database. Um, our security model isn't designed for that either. We have SASL authentication at the mincache connection layer, uh, but that's not really what you want to do for a mobile client. And then more importantly, you're authenticating to this gigantic namespace with all the user's data in it anyway. So yeah, that's what your application server is for, essentially. So any year for security encryption and authentication for the application? Yeah, I, again, the question is about security, and you know, most of the time, I'd say all of the time people are running these, you know, inside of a security group on EC2, you know, or otherwise restricted access via firewalls. And then as far as security, what we have now is uh, by default, if you can connect to the server, you can do any data operations. But it's possible to lock down a bucket, lock down a namespace where it requires a password for access. And then in the future, we'll be adding read-only modes so that you can have less privileged users. Anything else? All right, uh, thank you, and, and come catch me afterwards. <laughs>